In this issue of ABC's Wide World of Flying, Captain Barry Schiff puts you in a Super Cub on floats and shows you how to fly a seaplane. Bill Cox gives you a left seat checkout in the Glass Air 3, a 300 mile an hour hot rod. Phil Boyer shows you the new portable battery powered Azure Loran, which could be a pretty handy gadget for use in rental airplanes or airplanes with no electrical systems. Dave Jackson brings you a unique aerial view of the beautiful canyon lands of southern Utah. Rod Machado gives you several winter pre-flight tips. And Barry Schiff takes you to the International Seaplane Splash-In at Greenville, Maine, one of the most interesting and beautiful flying events in the world. In our bonus buyer's guide at the end of this tape, John and Martha King bring you some new tips on flying technique. North Star Avionics shows you the capabilities of their M1 Loran. Pilot's Video Source shows you some exciting new videotapes for aviation and historical buffs. And the Aircraft Owners and Pilots Association shows you its services for members. All this and more in this issue of ABC's Wide World of Flying. Welcome to the seventh video edition of ABC's Wide World of Flying. As you can tell from our box cover photograph, this tape has a very special seaplane orientation. Barry Schiff and our crew strayed far from their Southern California home base to Moosehead Lake, the largest lake in Maine, for the annual International Seaplane Association get-together. In two different stories, you'll get a real feel for what it's like to fly a seaplane. But first, I'd like to comment on a new game in town. G-A-M-E stands for General Aviation Market Expansion Plan, an ambitious new program to educate the public to the benefits of general aviation as not only a travel alternative, but also as a lifestyle and career alternative. You know, in early 1988, the National Air Transportation Association funded a major research study they found that most people had no familiarity with the term general aviation. Now, private aircraft or small airplane were familiar, but reflected a limited understanding of what these planes could do or were doing. In this world of airline deregulation, 70% of all air passengers travel from only 25 hub airports. 125 cities have lost scheduled airline service. Of this country's more than 12,000 landing facilities, general aviation serves 97% of them. Yet only 500 airports are used by the major airlines. For every hour an airliner flies, general aviation aircraft will fly three hours. You may have seen ads which have appeared recently in magazines like Time, the Wall Street Journal, and a host of other publications promoting the benefits of business travel by charter plane. You know, GA is a $15 billion a year industry, including air ambulances, agriculture operations, law enforcement, and for many of us, a very special lifestyle. Now, over the next three years of this plan, you may see television commercials like this. Now, let me get this straight. You, Jack, and Charlie, you're going to get up at 5 in the morning so you can fly to Memphis and wait for an hour for a commuter flight. You got it. Then you're going to rent a car, drive for two hours to get to your meeting, that's ridiculous. You'll be exhausted. You're telling me. Well, couldn't you just rent a plane? You mean charter? Are you serious? Do you have any idea what that would cost? No. Do you? The game plan is funded voluntarily by industry participants and supervised by the General Aviation Task Force, including representatives from the NBAA, AOPA, and the Helicopter Association International. 
Increased awareness of the benefits of general aviation can only serve to benefit all of us who fly. You can support this effort in several ways yourself. Talk up using charter aircraft to your business friends, or use your pilot skills to transport them to a convenient destination airport unserved by the airlines. And of equal importance, patronize those FBOs and aviation businesses that display the general aviation emblem. This means they contribute to the fund usually through a donation based on fuel, service, or product sales. The game plan is a good plan. And as they look for industry-wide support in the coming year, we wish them the very best. Right now, Barry Schiff demonstrates the techniques of seaplane flying, another useful and exciting segment of general aviation. Why do you suppose this pilot's wearing such a wide grin? <laughs> Simple, really. He's about to fly a seaplane, something guaranteed to put a smile on any pilot's face. That's because seaplanes combine the best of two worlds, motorboating and flying. Now, transitioning to a seaplane is relatively easy and a lot of fun, but there are some differences to consider. To begin with, landlubber pilots have to get used to some nautical terms. Now this is no longer the nose, it's the bow. That's no longer the tail, it's the stern. And this isn't a rope, it's a line. And forget about left and right, because from now on, it's port and starboard. The pre-flight inspection begins with checking each float for possible leakage. Now each float contains several watertight compartments so that if one should spring a leak, the others will provide enough buoyancy to keep the airplane afloat. Now a little water always manages to seep into each compartment and up to a cupful is allowed. If you find much more water than that, the float probably will have to be repaired before the airplane can be flown. Now this montage of metal parts needs to be checked for security. Uh, this is called a spreader bar. This is a strut. And these, of course, are called wire braces. Now since a seaplane doesn't have a steerable nose wheel or a steerable tail wheel, it needs a water rudder for maintaining directional control while taxiing. Now as you can see, a water rudder isn't particularly sturdy. It's not built to withstand the tremendous forces encountered during takeoff and landing. And that's why, using a cable in the cockpit, the rudder must be raised before takeoff and not lowered until after landing. And like other watercraft, a seaplane is equipped with an anchor for uh, mooring in open water and a pair of paddles just in case and of course a life preserver for each passenger. Now be sure to keep these handy during flight. Stowing them in the baggage compartment might prevent you from getting at them in time of need. The remainder of the pre-flight inspection is the same as pre-flighting any land plane. But since a seaplane is operated on water, you should drain more than the usual amount of fuel. And now for the fun part. You got your fishing gear handy? Good. Hop aboard. Just remember that a seaplane doesn't have brakes and it'll move forward just as soon as the engine starts. And if you expect to have any directional control at all, be sure that the water rudders have been lowered and operate normally. Now one nice thing about making a takeoff on a seaplane is you generally have a very long runway. But one thing you have to be very careful about is checking for obstacles, ledges sticking out from shore, rocks, submerged objects. Okay, right now we're headed into the wind. Of course, you don't have any brakes, so when you make a run-up, you'll be moving. Before applying run-up power, get the stick all the way back. As you add power, the nose will come up somewhat, and you'll begin to plow. Plowing is where the nose of the floats comes up out of the water. The airplane pitches into a slightly nose-high attitude. 
And you don't go very fast. Gives you time to check your max. Okay, controls are checked. Instruments checked. Gasoline is on the fullest tank. Trim tab is set. Run up is complete. Water rudder is now raised. And we'll begin our takeoff. Well, at full power, pull the stick all the way back. The nose will come up and up and up. And this is called the plowing or humping phase. When the nose comes up a little more, we release some of the back pressure. And the floats, much like the hull of a motorboat, a high-speed motorboat, will begin to plane. And this is called being on the step. And we simply hold it right here until we get enough speed, lift the nose, and there we are, we're airborne. Once airborne, a seaplane handles just like an airplane on wheels. But the added drag and weight of floats do affect performance. For example, a Cessna 172 modified with floats has a cruising speed of only 95 knots, and that's 21 knots slower than a conventional 172. Climb performance, payload, range, and other factors are also affected. But for these sacrifices, the seaplane pilot is rewarded with unparalleled versatility and enjoyment. Now let's try a water landing and you'll see what I mean. We're downwind now, I mean the imaginary runway. Of course, uh, again, the nice thing about using a large body of water like a lake is you can land in almost any direction and almost always into the wind. And the only exceptions, of course, are when you're landing on a river or a narrow channel. Similarly, when you make a landing in a seaplane, you're not landing on a cleared runway, so you have to be careful about obstructions in the water, rocks, ledges, and things like that. In fact, one of the seaplane pilot's uh, biggest worries is high-tension wires, telephone wires and the like. So you want to be awfully careful, since you're landing on uh, an unimproved strip, if you will, that the area is clear. If you're not sure, you can always drag it once before you land. The approach is fairly conventional, almost the same as in a land plane. Power back, slow to approach speed. First notch of flaps. And now we've got full flaps. And we'll make a power off approach. A successful landing in a float plane, of course, is made into the wind. Fortunately, uh, you have a choice of landing directions when landing on a lake. It's always easy to land into the wind. And a landing is very much like landing in a tail dragger. You land in a fairly nose-high attitude with the bows of the floats out of the water. We'll begin a conventional flare when we get down to about, uh, oh, 10 feet or so above the water. And remember, we're going to land in a fairly nose-high attitude. Right here we're breaking the flare, holding it off, hit the nose up, nose up, and just kind of hold it off, nose high until we touch, there we go, and you got to hold the stick back, because there's a tremendous amount of drag on the floats. The airplane will have a tendency to pitch forward unless you hold the stick back. And uh, the airplane then settles, it feels like it's sinking, into what is called the displacement mode, where the airplane is simply resting on its floats. Now that we're on the water, I'll extend the water rudder and uh, use the water rudders to reverse course and head back toward a point from which we can begin a takeoff. If the wind is uh, not too strong, fairly light and variable, the water rudder works very, very effectively. Just push the rudder to the right. The airplane turns to the right just like on a boat. Push the rudder to the left and the seaplane will turn to the left. Just like the rudder on a boat, it's very, very effective. And the seaplane on the water is surprisingly maneuverable. When you're taxiing downwind, you want to be very careful to keep the stick or the wheel fully forward, keep the elevator down to prevent the wind from getting underneath the tail and lifting it. Because if the tail comes up on a seaplane and it's not too difficult for that to happen, the bows or the noses of the floats will dig in and submerge and possibly cause the airplane to flip over. That's particularly true in strong winds. Also, when taxiing downwind, you use very little power, idle power preferably, 
Just let the airplane coast. Turning upwind is really easy because a seaplane is an overgrown weather vane that wants to turn into the wind all by itself. As a matter of fact, this natural tendency to weather vane enables a pilot to precisely determine wind direction without a windsock or other wind indicator. Now here, I've used the water rudders to turn crosswind and have just neutralized all controls. Even though the wind is fairly light, notice that the aircraft weather vanes slowly toward the right and continues turning all by itself until pointed directly into the wind and is on the optimum heading for takeoff. Turning downwind is much more difficult. This is because a pilot must overcome the weather veining tendency of a seaplane to turn into the wind. Now turning away from a strong headwind is done by blowing prop wash across the tail to increase the effectiveness of the conventional rudder. Such a power on turn requires holding the aircraft in a nose high attitude. Otherwise the propeller will pick up substantial spray which can substantially damage or even destroy the leading edges of an expensive propeller. If you uh, land on a large lake, then decide that you have to taxi about two or three miles, then you do what is called step taxi. In other words, you'll begin to make a takeoff. The airplane will accelerate out of the hump phase. It'll stop plowing, get up on the step, but instead of allowing the airplane to take off, as we get on the step, we'll bring the power back by about a third or a half, whatever's required, and just keep the airplane planing on the step, just like a high-speed motorboat. And we'll demonstrate that right now. Full power, stick back, just like we're going to make it take off. Nose up, bows out of the water. Now we go up, onto the step, and just as we start to accelerate on the step, we bring the power back, way back to about, oh, in this airplane, 1,700 RPM. And now we're just riding on the step, just like a high-speed motorboat. The nice thing about it is that uh, you can feel where the sweet spot is. And the sweet spot to a seaplane pilot means that if you raise the nose too high while you're on the step, you'll add drag if you lower the nose too much, you'll add drag, and if you can find just the right attitude for planing or riding on the step, you'll achieve maximum speed. And you can practice that while taxiing at high speed on the step. Also when on the step, a pilot can use his conventional rudder to make step turns. Now such high speed maneuvering may be necessary to avoid obstacles on the water, or when racing a speedboat across a lake but be very careful to avoid step turning into a strong crosswind. Centrifugal force and the wind can combine to cause a float plane to capsize toward the outside of the turn. We're now going to simulate glassy water takeoff. A lot of people wonder what's so tough about taking off on glassy water. Well, sometimes the water is so smooth that the little bubbles of air that normally ride underneath the floats when you take off on slightly choppy water, they're absent. And the airplane will have a difficult time accelerating at times on very, very glassy water. So sometimes what you have to do is make a circle in the water to stir it up. And that way the water becomes a little rough and you can make a normal takeoff. Or what you can do is attempt to make a normal takeoff and when you see that the aircraft is not accelerating, lift one float out of the water, which is kind of like making a crosswind takeoff. That reduces the drag. Only one float is now in the water, and the airplane will accelerate further, and you will then make a normal takeoff. Now let's see if we can demonstrate that. Stick back, full throttle, and water rudder retracted. Okay, we're now on the step, and we'll imagine that we're unable to accelerate, so I'm going to raise one wing. One floats out of the water, and now we can lift off. There we go. One of a seaplane pilot's greatest challenges, however, 
is landing on glassy water. This is because a pilot has very little depth perception when flying low over a mirror-like surface. It's very difficult to judge height above such smooth water. Consequently, a pilot might flare and stall while too high above the water, or he might not begin the flare soon enough, and contacting the water in such a nose-low attitude can cause the bows of the floats to dig in and flip the aircraft like a pancake. We're now going to simulate a glassy water landing. In other words, we're going to imagine that the water is so smooth and so reflective that we can't see where the water is. Sometimes you think you can see the surface of the water, but in fact you're looking down at the bottom of the bottom body of water. And the way you make a glassy water landing is to set up an approach in a nose-high attitude at approximately 10% above stall and use your power to adjust the sink rate so that it's no more than about 150 feet per minute. You begin this procedure when you know you're safely above the water. And if you do this from about 200 feet down, then you'll simply allow the airplane to contact the water without flaring in a nose-high attitude while sinking at 150 feet a minute and while flying at 10% above stall. Now I'll imagine that the water is very, very glassy. And at about, uh, oh, this altitude, 200 feet or so, I'll start to raise the nose, slow the airspeed to about 10% above stall, start to add power so that I'm only sinking about 150 feet per minute. And I'm going to pretend I don't know where the water is. I'm simply going to allow the airplane to contact the water this nose high attitude. As soon as we touch, get the stick back, throttle back, make sure we don't pop off the water, of course. If you pull the stick back too quickly, you might pop off the water, in which case you want to make a missed approach quickly. The worst part about flying a seaplane, or any other fun machine for that matter, is having to end the flight. Although docking usually is a simple exercise, it can be challenging, especially when the wind is blustery and dockside assistance unavailable. The general rule states that a dock should be approached as slowly as possible and while heading directly into the wind or current, a maneuver that occasionally is easier said than done. Happiness is flying a seaplane. It is not worrying about an engine failure when over water. It is extending the range of your pleasure to include 10 mile long waterways of clear sparkling water and feeling the exhilaration of skimming the surface of a lake at a mile a minute. It is landing so smoothly that you feel as though you're skiing down a mountain of virgin snow. It's flying to where the fish are biting and not having to worry about a boat when you get there because the seaplane pilot brings his own boat, a boat with wings. Probably the only group of pilots who never have to worry about departing with ice, frost, or snow on their aircraft are those fellas flying hot air balloons. But seriously, even an apparent non-threatening eighth of an inch of ice, frost, or snow in the airfoil can reduce lifting efficiencies by as much as 15%. And this is a very serious hazard. So it's important to remove all ice from the airfoil prior to takeoff. Now, on a low-wing aircraft, well, that's an easy chore. On a high-wing aircraft, that's just a chore. Here are a few tips. First, don't even think about using this. If it's cold enough to form frost, then any water sprayed on the aircraft could potentially freeze in critical places like control surfaces. A nice non-abrasive squeegee, stiff brush, or even a thick glove along with a stepladder will usually be all that's necessary for safely removing all the ice from the aircraft. Remember, a 15% loss of lift on takeoff is real serious business. So if ice, frost, or snow is not removed prior to takeoff or it accumulates during taxi, it's a good time to return to the coffee shop and log a little extra hangar flying. The indicated stalling speed of an airplane is most affected by variations in number one, air temperature, number two, 
flight altitude, or number three, airplane loading? The correct answer is number three. Answers one and two have no effect on indicated airspeed. But variations in airplane loading does affect stability, and therefore the indicated airspeed at which the airplane will stall. Wow! It's called the Glass Air 3, and if you hadn't already guessed, it's the fastest piston-powered home-built kit plane available. What you just saw was a 300 mile per hour low pass here at Glass Air's home airport in Arlington, Washington. I had the privilege of flying the original Stoddard Hamilton Glass Air TD back in 1980 with designer Tom Hamilton, and the RG and Glass Air 2 later. Today, ABC's Wide World of Flying has come to Arlington to examine and fly the latest piston evolution of the Glass Air idea, the exciting 300 horsepower Glass Air 3. There are essentially four models in the current Glass Air line. The first Glass Air tail dragger was a revolutionary airplane when it was introduced in 1979. With only 160 horsepower under the bonnet, fixed gear and a fixed pitch prop out front, Tom Hamilton's slick fiberglass Glass Air TD kit plane is capable of climb at 1,400 feet per minute and cruise at well over 200 miles per hour. For traditionalist pilots, the tailwheel airplane offers excellent performance and superior ground maneuverability. The Glass Air RG was the next logical step in the model's evolution. This airplane brought the convenience and easy handling of tricycle retractable gear to the Glass Air and improved crews 10 to 15 miles per hour in the process. Predictably, it was an instant success on the home-built market. The third Glass Air model was essentially the same airplane, but with fixed tricycle gear. This was intended to appeal to the pilot looking for Glass Air performance without the added complexity of retractable gear. All three of the Glass Air models were approved for use with either the 160 horsepower 0320 or 180 horsepower 0360 Lycoming engines. The difference was about 300 feet per minute in climb and 10 miles per hour in cruise. Top of the line though is the 300 horsepower Glass Air 3, the most exciting model of all from Glass Air. If the various Glass Airs look slick and professional, that's because they're produced by one of the largest and most well-established companies in the history of home-built aviation. Stoddard Hamilton Aircraft in Arlington, Washington is a diversified, thriving business that's into more than just fiberglass airplanes. In fact, a Stoddard Hamilton subsidiary, Aeroset Incorporated, builds remotely piloted test vehicles under contract to Boeing. The primary products, however, are the Glass Air series of home builds. The man responsible for the day-to-day -day operation of Stoddard Hamilton is company president Ted Setzer. Ted, do you have a count of the number of Glass Air kits that have been sold of all models and also the number of aircraft that are actually completed as of now? We've sold over 930 kits to date worldwide. 250 Glass Airs are flying based on a recent survey. Over 70,000 hours, total airframe hours, logged on Glass Airs to date. I imagine your most popular kit sale these days is the Glass Air 3, isn't it? That's right, Bill. We're targeting the sports car market of the skies. With a 300-horse Lycoming engine, and about 50 knots extra speed with the Glass Air 3, that our customers are willing to pay that extra price to go that fast. Could you tell me a little bit about how Stoddard Hamilton produces the fiberglass parts to minimize uh, heat buildup on Glass Airs? We use a Derricane vinyl ester resin, and uh, they classify the thermal properties of different resins as T sub G, the glass transition temperature. The glass transition temperature of our particular resin is 220 degrees Fahrenheit. As long as an airplane is painted white, uh, its skin surface temperatures are uh, not that much above ambient. 
uh, DuPont did a color energy absorption chart where they measured the effects of different colors on skin surfaces of aircraft. And a white airplane on a 100 degree day doesn't see skin surface temperatures much over about 140 degrees Fahrenheit. But you take a darker airplane, some of the darker shades, color shades, and they'll see skin surface temperatures up around 190 degrees Fahrenheit. Ultraviolet radiation can be taken care of with a, with a good barrier. And we use a, a primer on all, a primer surface coat on all of our fiberglass parts from the factory that gives 100% ultraviolet protection. Our fiberglass construction involves a three-step process. Uh, the first step is to, is to laminate the outer skins in place. And once those have cured, we vacuum bag the foam core down as a separate process. After the core has been vacuum bagged and cured, we will laminate the inner skins in place. So it's three steps, and it takes about two to three days to complete a fiberglass part. The metal parts in a glass air kit are all um, machined, they're all formed, they're all heat treated, stress relieved if necessary. Depends on the requirement of each individual part. But one thing people will notice about a glass air kit is that the parts are all finished. There's a mil spec surface finish on nearly every part, uh, whether it's anodizing, CAD plating, painting. And there's a lot of parts in a glass air kit that are subassembled. We, we don't expect that a, one of our customers would have to go out and buy a ream or buy a press to press in a bearing and then ream it. Uh, those bushings and bearings are all factory installed to our tolerances. Psychologically, building a glass air has a distinct advantage. Um, by putting the fuselage halves together, by putting the, the wing halves together, by putting the tail surfaces together, the builder essentially has a recognizable airplane. And rather than spending one to two hundred hours just working on a jig to assemble an airplane, he's spent one to two hundred hours assembling an airframe, and he's got something to look at and say, I've got an airplane I'm working on here. And psychologically, it keeps him going. It keeps him pumped, and it keeps him working on his project. Keeping pumped shouldn't be much of a problem, considering the looks and performance of the finished product, especially if it comes out anything like the flight test airplane. Everywhere you look, starting back on the tip of the tail, the Glass Air 3 is as slick and flushed as it's possible to build it. If you expect to reach cruise numbers near 300 miles per hour on 300 horsepower, the aerodynamics have to be right. Glass Air's Ted Setzer walked me through a thorough pre-flight prior to our test top in the company's number one prototype. Actually, Setzer pointed out the clean up. interface of flaps and ailerons with the upper and lower wing surface, the upswept high lift wing tip that makes maximum use of vortices for lift, plus the flush mounted gas cap and position light near the critical wing leading edge. The Glass Air 3's long-legged retractable gear is of a fairly conventional oleo strut design. It retracts hydraulically and utilizes Cleveland wheels and brakes, plus 500 by 5 tires. Because I expected to be doing some acro on this flight, Setzer suggested we leave the oil level down a quart or two to avoid blowing the top court during outside maneuvers. On the pointy end of the airplane, Spinner fit tolerances are as near perfect as possible. There's minimum gap left to spill draggy air. If it's really true that beautiful airplanes are guaranteed to fly well, this one should be an absolute jewel in flight. One obvious reason for its outstanding performance is simply its horsepower. Like the Shelby Cobra and Ferrari Daytona, the Glass Air 3 was designed on the old fighter pilot premise that you can never have enough power. Flying at a maximum gross weight of 2,400 pounds, each of the Glass Air 3's 300 horses has to lift only 8 pounds of airplane, and that's bound to translate to exciting performance. Another feature that improves cruise and climb is the Glass Air 3's long wingtips. 24-inch extensions that increase wing area, lower the aspect ratio, and boost both cruise and climb performance. The short tips are designed for aerobatics and interchange in about 15 minutes. The Glass Air 3's cabin is about 42 inches wide, the same horizontal dimension as the Bonanza. Seating position is semi-reclined, something like a miniature F-16. Despite the airplane's small overall size, the instrument panel is large enough to accommodate virtually everything you could ask for except weather radar.
With all those horses out front, you can't help but wonder if the airplane won't simply turn hard left when you push the power to the stop. Certainly, for most pilots without military experience, the Glass Air 3 promises about the quickest acceleration of anything short of an S1 pits. Sure enough, the acceleration is there, but the airplane turns out to have plenty of rudder to handle the torque. When the Glass Air does rotate and lift off, there's no hesitation to catch its breath. It starts uphill immediately, typically pushing the VSI around to 3,000 feet per minute at gross. Because this is a normally aspirated engine and optimum cruise height is between 7,000 and 10,000 feet, you can plan on reaching cruise altitude in under five minutes at VY. Even pushed over to a climb at 150 knots, you'll still see something like 1,400 feet per minute on the VSI. Yeah, why don't you take the airplane for just a second here. Where the Glass Air 3 truly shines though is in flat out high speed cruise. Leave everything to the wall at 8,500 feet and you'll see something like 250 miles per hour indicated airspeed for about 280 true. Like all little airplanes with big horsepower, the glass air is fairly sensitive to loading, so if you're flying alone, you'll probably see quite a bit more speed. The airplane burns something in the order of uh, 15 to 17 gallons an hour at 75% power. And with 61 gallons in the tank, you've got something like uh, a little less than four hours range. Even the optional fuel system adds only about uh, 11 gallons with the extended wingtips. So uh, it still doesn't improve your range too terribly much. But uh, it's not necessary to use maximum cruise power on the glass air in order to get good speed. You can use 55%. You'll reduce your burn down to about 12 gallons an hour and push the range out to something like 1,300 nautical miles, which ought to be enough for just about anyone. With all its horsepower and minimal weight, the Glass Air 3 has an exceptional service ceiling, something on the order of 23,000 feet. Even with the wingtip extensions, the wings are still relatively short, and the high wing loading assures a good ride in turbulence. Aerobatics are really a kick in the Glass Air 3. Uh, the airplane is capable of just about anything you are with stress limits in the vicinity of plus 6 and minus 4 G's. It can do uh, rolls, loops, hammerheads, uh, the full gamut of maneuvers. As a matter of fact, Bob Herendine and Bud Granley, the two aerobatic pilots who fly for Glass Air, have subjected the airplane to such maneuvers as Lomshevox and uh, vertical rolls, two, three vertical rolls in a row. The roll rate is uh, somewhere in the vicinity of 160 degrees per second, so a full aileron roll demands only uh, a little less than three seconds. You do have to keep in mind when you're doing vertical maneuvers, however, that this is a very high-speed airplane and therefore it demands uh, quite, a, quite a bit of sky. You might expect such high-speed antics to dictate big approach speeds, but that's not really the case. The flaps lower the stall speed to allow approaches as slow as 90 miles per hour. In truth, the Glass Air 3 isn't a short field airplane, nor was its tall retractable gear designed to accommodate dirt strips. But otherwise, its manners in the pattern are exemplary. The obvious question is, what does all this performance and excitement cost? The standard Glass Air 3 kit, without engine, prop, instruments, or radios, sells for $28,500. Plan on spending about another $30,000 for those last items, and you'll wind up with all the pieces for a Glass Air 3 for less than the base price of virtually any production airplane. If you'd rather not spend the 1,500 hours of construction time to build the airplane yourself, you can form a partnership with another builder to have a little help. Whether you do build it yourself or have help, there's little question the Glass Air offers phenomenal performance, better than any current home-built on the market. If sheer flat-out speed, spectacular climb, and aerobatic handling are your bag, you'll be hard-pressed to find a better home-built and Stoddard Hamilton's wild Glass Air 3.
Come on here, huh? What's the matter with you? Where'd you learn to drive, huh? Correspondence school? Shh. Don't you hate traffic? Don't you wish you could just pull back on the steering wheel and fly away? Better Bolt Taylor asked himself that question in 1947, and by 1950, he developed the first aero car. It flew all right. It just didn't sell. Bolt hasn't given up. This is my playhouse, this little airplane up here. When we visited him in his Longview, Washington workshop, he was hard at work on yet another model, his fourth. We're talking about 175 miles an hour. No, when you get to Seattle at 175 miles an hour, you means you're in Seattle in a half an hour. You can take your wings off in three minutes, drive into the hotel, you're right at the doorstep of where you want to go. Moult is a 76-year-old, semi-retired aeronautical engineer. After 40 years, he's still convinced there's an aero car in your future. As C.R. Smith, the former president of United Airlines, said to me, he said, Taylor, the flying automobile would do the same thing to the airlines that the automobile did to the railroads, passenger railroads. Why? Because it goes door to door. Entrepreneur and vintage plane buff Gary Norton of Apple, Idaho, picked up one of the three original aero cars for a song. He's actually flown it twice. I think it uh, could use a little bit more horsepower from the times I've been flying it, but other than that, uh, it seems pretty airworthy. Swing left wing tip forward to hook front spar. Drive the aero car doesn't just sprout wings, it's more of a do-it-yourself assembly kit. I'm told it's a snap once you get the hang of it. You may be wondering why your intrepid reporter isn't going along for the ride. It's not that I didn't want to. It's just that the FAA hasn't cleared the aero car for passengers. This particular model cruises at around 100 miles per hour and it doesn't need much of a runway. But what about that crucial moment when your aero car lifts off the ground and suddenly becomes an aero plane? There's a little confusion at not flying it a lot of times in that there are pedals on the floor for both the airplanes and the car and you have to get off the airplane controls onto the car controls once you hit the ground. And also the wheel in the air works your aileron controls like a normal airplane, but on the ground it steers the front of the car. So there's definitely a little transition phase you go into when you first land and take off. When you think about it, it's kind of strange that after 40 years, a country responsible for manned space flight and chicken McNuggets hasn't been able to market a flying car. Actually, the big problem is meeting the government requirements for cars. The airplane part we've already done. Remember, you can, you've got an unlimited freeway that goes everywhere. The only reason you can't drive it is because you don't have the right kind of a car. Ancient man dreamt of flight. Modern man dreams of making it to work on time. Bolt Taylor's vision is to combine those dreams and send them soaring. What can one man do to change the world? Make cars fly. If I don't do it, somebody else will. Winter flying wouldn't be nearly so much of a problem if all a pilot had to do was put chains on the wings to handle icing conditions. Unfortunately, ice forming on airplanes cause fatal accidents every year. Here are a few things you should be careful to check during your pre-flight. First and most obvious, make sure the exterior of the airplane has been thoroughly de-iced, particularly the wings. Take care to make sure that snow or snow melt has not entered the heater ducts or the engine air inlet on the inner cowling. Any type of air blockage here could cause uneven airflow, possibly overheating the engine. Check the prop spinner. Any snow melt entering and refreezing can throw it seriously out of balance, resulting in damage to the spinner or worse. Check the static system and the pitot tube and make sure they're free from icing. Any ice block in the static system can usually be wiped away, and ice block in the pitot tube can be handled with a short burst of pitot heat. One caution, however, never under any circumstance blow into a static port or a pitot tube. The very sensitive pressure instruments can easily be damaged. Check all flight control surfaces for freedom of movement from ice obstructions. 
Do this from inside as well as outside of the aircraft. Water leaking into the aft part of the fuselage and freezing can cause serious weight and CG problems. Therefore, belly drain holes should be checked clear and free of obstructions prior to every flight. And finally, it's highly recommended that wheel pants be removed during winter weather since snow or slush thrown up into the interior may freeze, preventing wheels from rotating. In 20 years of flying, I can't remember an avionics device that has been as useful and popular as Loran C. Almost every month, another newly designed Loran receiver is marketed, and we've shown units like the North Star, Apollo, and RNAV on past video issues. But in my What's New feature, I'm not going to show you one of the new high tech models, just a plain vanilla, low cost, no database Loran. Does your flight case have room for the Azure locator, as it's called? It's a unique Loran for any pilot even those who don't own airplanes, because it's fully portable. It weighs only five pounds, and most of that weight is because of the rechargeable lead-acid battery, which lasts up to 100 hours. Yes, you heard me right, 100 hours, eliminating the need to charge it between every flight. When you do go to recharge it with this little AC adapter, all it takes is overnight for a full charge. No, it doesn't even have a cigarette lighter adapter. The people at Azure Technology figure it's best to keep the unit isolated from the aircraft electrical system, like noisy alternators, generators, plugs, and so forth, for best operation. Whoops, I just made the assumption the airplane you fly has an electrical system, since the Azure locator adds Loran navigation to a non-electrical aircraft. Now, this means it can be used in classics, gliders, hot air balloons, ultralights, you name it. Owners without any available panel space to add a Loran find the locator a solution to their problem. This is the ideal unit for the renter pilot when the aircraft available doesn't contain a panel-mounted Loran. Some FBOs will probably start renting these units like many now do portable intercoms and headsets. A simple 12-button keypad controls the input and the keys are plainly labeled for ease of operation. Now the basic Azure locator package sells for $8.95 and consists of the portable Loran unit, mounting bracket and knobs for a permanent or semi-permanent installation, 110-volt battery charger, and a telescoping antenna. The antenna basically is for testing and use outside the airplane, and that means you'll definitely want to add the optional portable antenna kit at $35. And if the unit won't fit in your flight kit, there's a padded carrying case available for $30. That's it no other extras and as their literature states there's no hassle with expensive updates to the database now what they don't tell you is there is no factory database but there's a school of thought among many loran owners that if you don't fly that far or that often why have the up to 28,000 waypoint databases that newer lorans promote now in the past i've shown you how to build a power supply to program and work with panel mounted lorans at home well no problem for this unit since it's designed to be used anywhere so let's look at some of the features that you might want to work with before you go flying. You put in up to 99 waypoints of your own choosing and call them up by waypoint number. Now Azure provides a handy card to keep track of what you've programmed. Naturally, a book like AccuQuick or the data log becomes a necessity to look up the necessary lat longs for input into the unit. Here's how that works. Let's say we wanted to permanently store Santa Paula Airport in the waypoint three position. Well, our directories give us a lat long for Santa Paula, and you select display waypoint number on the membrane keypad of the Azure locator. Then input the two-digit number, 03, and the screen will read out whatever has been stored previously. Hit the change clear key to get rid of the old waypoint, and then we enter the new coordinates. In this case, 3420.8. 11903.6 and we add a zero because you'll note it allows entry of lat long through one hundredths of a minute which is more precise than coordinates listed on some charts or airport guides. Now once the last digit of the longitude is entered 
the machine is ready for any other task. Now, there's no enter key, and most operations end with the entry itself. And believe it or not, there's even a flight plan mode that allows you to chain 40 of the 99 waypoints together into a flight plan for automatic tracking by the Azure locator. The aircraft portable antenna kit consists of a telescoping whip antenna with two suction cups on each end. It attaches to the back of the locator with a standard BNC connector. Now, this allows it to be used with other aircraft antennas if desired. The manufacturer suggests the old ADF long wire antennas make excellent Loran reception devices. In addition, there's a ground wire to attach to any available point on the airplane. The antenna is the most critical part of the whole setup. Some experimentation is necessary to find the location that works best in the planes you fly. When working with the antenna, you've got to be both persistent and patient. Azure suggests the antenna be as extended and as vertical as possible. Well, I couldn't find an airplane that allowed the antenna to be mounted vertically in the window, fully extended. After several trials, the antenna position that worked best in a 172 was horizontal and mounted at the top of the windscreen. Now, once you establish the best location for each aircraft you fly, this no longer becomes a pre-flight task. When the unit is first turned on, what the manufacturer terms a cold start, you need to tell it where it's located by giving it a nearby latitude and longitude. At that point, it will determine the correct GRI, in this case, 9940. A cold start is required only each time the unit has been moved a great distance while turned off. It takes the Azure locator about five minutes to acquire the master and two usable secondary stations. This is a little longer than most panel-mounted Lorans, but considering the work it has to go to with less signal strength from the portable antenna, that's pretty good. And during warm-up, you can watch the display while it shows you signal strength on a scale from 0 to 9 for the master and W, X, Y, and even Z secondaries. Now, any number 5 or above is acceptable, and I found that the unit locks up on signals as low as 4. During warm-up, you can find out exactly what's going on with each of the signals. But with any Loran, the fun is flying. So let's take to the air with our pre-programmed locator. Available by pushing the lat long button. 
One caution, ready indicating the Loran has acceptable signals, is only shown on a few screens. Perhaps because of my concern for antenna location, I'd feel more comfortable if the locator had a better signal loss warning system, like a red light or the entire display flashing. To access infrequently used functions and to do other special things, the Azure people have come up with a system using the special key. For instance, to view the arrival alarm distance in the unit, you'd hit the special key, and then a one and a seven. And the display will then show us a distance of one mile. To reset the distance, you'd hit the special key, one, eight, and then set in any distance between one and 99 nautical miles, let's say five miles. Now, where did I get those numbers, 17 and 18, you ask? Well, this is a slight disadvantage. You must either have the manual handy or use the Azure Supplied card, which contains the Waypoint Journal on the back side. I'm sure with time you'd remember the ones most frequently used. Because Azure designed this portable unit to be used in planes, cars, boats, snowmobiles, or whatever other use that can be thought of, they have to deal with the difference in speeds between such things as cars and airplanes. Now for this they have a special function to input a speed factor. This lets the unit know how fast to calculate an average of the speed it determines between lat long updates. The special keys also give you access to one countdown timer, two count up timers, and a 24 hour clock. And like most Lorans, this one is placarded not for IFR use. I found the display fairly easy to read and it increases contrast and bright sunlight. Believe it or not, the unit is even backlighted for use at night. Obviously, the use of the nightlight shortens the battery life. However, the manual says continuous use of the backlight still gives you an unbelievable 35 hours between charges. Azure Technology, located at the San Jose, California Jet Center, should be applauded for entering an already crowded avionics field, but with something unique and different. Expect much more from this small but very innovative firm. For now, however, the Azure Locator Portable Loran should prove to be a popular item for many applications. Why do we fly? Aren't the practical reasons often justification for the real reason? To fly like a bird and enjoy the grand view? A company called Miramar Productions has produced several videotapes featuring original music and unique views of the American West with what we believe is exceptional skill and sensitivity. This particular segment, just one of several selections of a 45-minute tape, was shot at normal camera speed from a Cessna 310. No trick photography or special effects were used. And at the close, the camera was actually handheld with a steady cam.
The maximum indicated airspeed permitted for a piston-engined aircraft operating within an airport traffic area located outside a terminal control area is number one, 156 knots, number two, 200 knots, or number three, 250 knots. The correct answer is number one, 156 knots. If the airport traffic area is located inside a terminal control area, the maximum speed allowed is 250 knots. Greenville, Maine. It's about halfway between Jackman and Millinocket on the southern tip of Moosehead Lake. Now these names may sound like places out of a TV sitcom, but they're real enough, especially for those who attend the annual ritual called the International Seaplane Splash-In. And we're here on the docks at Folsom's Air Service to explore the wonderful and sometimes wacky world of float planes and flying boats. Moosehead is the largest lake in Maine, measuring about 40 miles from north to south and surrounded by beautiful forests and dozens of other lakes and rivers. This is one of the greatest hunting and fishing areas in the northeastern United States. No wonder it's such a popular spot for seaplanes. The splash in here in Greenville is always held the weekend following Labor Day. This far north, the leaves are just starting to change and the weather is nippy and sometimes windy. In a town this small, motel and cabin rooms are at a premium, so be warned, make your reservations early. One approach to the Splash Inn takes you right over the town, but no one seems to mind. Tourists, fishermen and hunters are big business here, and seaplanes are an important part of the local economy. Folsom's Air Service caters to outdoorsmen, by taking them into remote and otherwise inaccessible lakes and rivers. The big de Havilland beaver they operate can carry a huge useful load, as this returning fishing party demonstrates. Four fishermen, a pilot, fishing gear, life preservers, clothes, camping gear, food, coolers, fuel, outboard motors, it's quite a load. But all part of a typical day's work for this big, tough seaplane. The splash-in begins on Friday with arrivals. More than a hundred seaplanes converge on the lake, some from as far away as Florida and Alaska. And you'll see all types of seaplanes here, like this gorgeous lake amphibian. Cessna 172s, a mall amphibian, Hyper Cubs, customized Seabees, a Helio Courier, de Havilland Beavers, Republic Seabees, home -builts, twin engine CBs, and this huge turboprop Cessna caravan. The International Seaplane Splash In is a fascinating event. Vendors with special seaplane products set up booths in the Forest Service hangar. There's lots of airplanes to look at and lots to talk about. Most of the people here are pilots and their families, and frankly, everyone is set for a nice time. We had a chance to talk with the president of the Seaplane Pilots Association, Dave Quam. Dave, how many seaplane pilots are there in the United States? 40,000 people have a seaplane rating to date. 40,000, how many of those are active? Well, that's the problem. Only about 5,000 people are actually making use of their rating and flying. They get the rating and a lot of them just have it to have it and don't use it. Well, that's too bad. So the active seaplane pilots are really a rather elite small group. Very small group, but they're growing. There's a lot of women now getting involved in seaplane flying. And how many seaplanes would you estimate there are in the United States? Last time we did a rough count, we'd have to estimate somewhere around five to 6,000 flying float planes. And how do you really tell if a guy has an airplane on floats or on skis? How do you count it as a seaplane? That's the problem. Uh, there's no way to keep track of what he has for landing gear. There's no requirement to register. Come wintertime, he takes the float off, puts wheels on for a while, and then puts skis on. And how do you know? You don't. So it's just an estimate, that's just all. Just an estimate, right. You know, the average land plane pilot imagines that a seaplane pilot simply flies over the countryside, looks down, spots a beautiful lake, and says, gee, I think I'll land there. Uh, can he land just anywhere? 
No, unfortunately that's not true. There are a lot of lakes that are reservoirs. You can't go into them. A rule of thumb is if you see outboard motors running on a lake, you probably can land. Not always true. The best source of that information is the seaplane water landing directory, which gives you uh, the places to land. It gives you the seaplane bases, state and federal regulations, custom stops, etc. And that's available with the, from the Seaplane Pilots Association. The Seaplane Pilots Association has been coming up here to Greenville for more than 15 years now. And as you can see from this historical footage, everyone's out to have a great time. Now, beavers are certainly versatile seaplanes. Look at this guy go, and on just one ski. Now this guy is really on the step. Past splash-ins have seen a number of interesting seaplanes show up, like this antique widgeon with its 300 horsepower Lycoming engines and converting a single-engine CB to a twin was a pretty ambitious project, but it sure could get out of the water. And this twin turboprop Nomad from Australia is an impressive seaplane for carrying a large load. For years, the takeoff contest has been a popular event, and the theme is always the same. Let's get out there and have a good time. And this year is no different. The takeoff contest is also a favorite with spectators. The purpose here is simply to be the first off the water. Airplanes are matched in classes by engine size and general performance, so piloting skill is a definite factor in winning. Now let's watch these pilots. Wow, that guy on the left really yanked it off for a win, didn't he? And then he gives us his version of a victory roll. One of the things I really enjoy at an event like this is looking at the more unusual airplanes. Like this 400 horsepower Helio Courier on floats, owned by Kurt Gibson. One of the great advantages of flying a seaplane is that lakes provide unlimited runway lengths, as do rivers. Tell me, why do you need a stole airplane when you have so much runway available? The nature of my type of flying is because I like short takeoff and landings, and it gets you into very remote, small lakes that most people can't get to. You don't see too many seaplanes that have leading edge slats, kind of like on jet airplanes. That's right. Are they very effective? They are very effective. At the right angle of attack, Actually, uh, what I hear that the wing lift can be doubled by the slats themselves. You mean the slats can create as much lift as the wing does? That's exactly right. A lot of land plane pilots really don't understand how you can justify maintaining an airplane, what it costs to operate. 400 horsepower, and you only go 120 miles an hour. How do you explain that? Well, it is expensive, but helicopters are very expensive, and they do very unique things, but this airplane also does extremely unique things. Oh, so the mission is worth the cost. Yes. Another interesting float plane is this two-place Avid Flyer with a Rotax engine. This particular kit was built by John Knapp, and I asked him to tell us a bit about it. The plane here is four years old. It took uh, 525 hours to build it. And when you buy a kit like this, uh, you get everything except your finished paint, instruments, covering everything. The float system, these are Zene Air floats. They're out of Canada. The floats are designed for a two-seat ultralight. They're, they display 700 pounds. They're really a borderline case for this. It's fine with one person in this plane, but with two people in it, it draws quite a bit of water. Uh, the new system now, Avid Flyer has floats that displace 1,100 pounds. You can see the differential. The takeoff, it, there, you know, it's a variable depending on how much wind we had. The average is about 100 feet. Uh, we've done it a 20 knot wind, and uh, it was four wave caps. So, you know, you're only talking about 50 feet. The rate of climb on takeoff is 2,200 feet a minute. Uh, that's equivalent to a 45 degree climb. Landing is, is there again, it's about 100, 150 feet. The landing technique with this plane is exactly the same as with a straight float plane, a conventional plane. Uh, the only thing is we can, we can do some drastic slips with this, which a conventional plane, that's a no-no. The Avid Flyer is easily transportable. Simple matter of taking off aluminum cover in the rear, pulling this pin, 
I'm just pivoting the wing around and it attaches on some bars in the rear. It's just a matter now of sliding it up and putting it on a flatbed. Just being at the Splash Inn is a wonderful experience. With a continual display of seaplanes overhead, as well as all the water activities at the ramp, it's quite a feast for any aviation buff. Another one of the fun events is the water bomb drop. Here the goal is simple, be the closest to hitting the target. The rules say you're supposed to stay 200 feet above the water, but some guys don't know much about rules. And being a judge can be a little hazardous. Maybe they should put the boat on the target. With so much valuable land, water bombing really is a pretty serious undertaking up here, as this Forest Service pilot is about to demonstrate. His de Havilland Beaver is equipped with a special 500 gallon tank, designed to be filled with just a low pass over the water. One attendee was really interested in this particular demonstration, our good friend Smokey the Bear. On a downwind leg, the pilot sets up his airplane for the approach and scores a perfect hit. These guys are real pros. One of the favorites here is this gorgeous 180 horsepower Super Cub on extremely rare Edo amphibious floats. Only nine sets of these floats were ever produced and only about three are known to exist in the United States. I'm Joe Hendel. ABC's Wide World of Flying and many, many other people around here have, have commented and complimented me on this uh, airplane project that I built from a prop duster, a Piper PA-18 in Colorado before it went down. We put a 180 horse Lycoming engine in it and uh, it adds just a, a little better, little more oomph to get this plane out of the water and, and move it. We have an IFR uh, instrument panel, which is a custom panel that I built myself. We have three seats tandem in the aircraft, which is extremely rare in a Super Cub. The left side door is a unique feature, which I pers personally uh, built and designed and have the supplemental type certificate for. We also have a stainless steel belly that makes clean out and inspection very, very easy. But I think the thing that really makes this plane stand out are these very rare Edo floats that were built by the Edo Corporation in 1957 for a fish spotting company. They are amphibious and they are the only amphibious floats that have ever been fitted or mated to a Piper Super Cub. Straight floats for a Super Cub are about $15,000, but these rare amphibious floats bring something like $50,000 a pair. So Joe's plane is not only unique, it's quite valuable as well. Looking around at the Splash Inn, you might get the idea that floats can be installed on just about any land plane, but that's not so. To get the inside story, I went to Jay Fry, who heads up Edo's float operation. Jay flies this gorgeous Cessna 206 fitted with his company's amphibious floats. Now, Jay, you've been flying floats for 25 years or so. You've got about 4,000 hours on floats. And you've written one of the finest little books on how to fly airplanes I've ever seen, how to fly floats. You really deserve congratulations on that. Now, as a guy who knows so much about floats, tell me, uh, people look at these uh, floats and they think, gee whiz, I have an airplane, I'd like to take off the wheels and put on floats. Can he do that? Well, you know, it's not really that simple, Barry. One of the problems is that most of the current model float planes, such as the Cessna uh, 172s or 180s or 185s, really have to leave the factory with some seaplane modifications to them. Oh. Some of the older aircraft, such as the Cubs and stuff, can be quite easily converted without these modifications. Mm -hmm. Well, if a fellow knows when he buys an airplane from the factory that he'd like to install floats, what does the factory do to make it ready? When the aircraft starts down the factory line, the first thing they do is what they call internal corrosion proofing, which primarily is zinc chromating between all the skins. The aircraft will generally carry additional um, uh, fuselage beef up. It might have reinforcement around the door. Most of them will carry stainless steel cables. They do want to get better cooling, so they'll modify the, either the baffling or the cowlings. That's interesting. Yeah. You know, I've noticed, particularly on your airplane, you have a ventral fin under the tail. Uh, some airplanes have them, some don't, but only seaplanes seem to have them. Why, when the airplane is modified for floats, is a ventral fin added? Okay, one of the problems that we have on floats is we also have to meet the same requirements that a land plane has to as part 23. And the aircraft must show good directional stability. Now, if you look at this airplane over here, you'll notice that almost more than half of the float is forward of the CG, and so it's actually acting like a reverse rudder 
and so we have to increase the rudder area after the tail and that's one of the, after the CG and that's one of the reasons you see the large fin areas that you see on this airplane here. So in effect you're restoring the stability to what it was before you put the floats on. That's a very good way to put it. A popular event is the Bush Pilots Canoe Race. It's a race against time. A two-man crew departs from the dock, one in a seaplane, the other in a canoe. They meet on a floating platform, pull the canoe out of the water, put it on one of the seaplane's floats, and tie it securely. Then they taxi out around a buoy, back to the dock where they started. Everyone is in a big hurry to offload that canoe. With the wind today, this is all pretty difficult. The event is timed until the canoe is offloaded at the dock. The team with the least time wins. Here's the only women's team that entered. I'll bet not too many of you have started an engine like this. And they're off. They get out to the platform in pretty good time. They pull the canoe onto the platform okay. But here the ladies have a little trouble. The canoe is pretty heavy and they lose time here. But there's no point in racing away from the dock if the canoe isn't well secured. But at last, they're off. Out around the buoy and a brisk taxi back to the dock. After offloading the canoe, the women finish with a very respectable time of just over three minutes, a fine showing. Also represented at the Splash Inn are the Lake Amphibians. I had a chance to speak with Bruce Rivard, Director of Marketing. Bruce, most seaplanes are, are float planes, and I guess a lot of people regard uh, floats as being afterthoughts being put onto land planes. And this is a flying boat, it has a, a hull. What's the difference between a float plane and a, a flying boat? Our airplane is designed as an amphibian. It's, it's, a, it's a boat hull with wings, and uh, it's a lot more efficient, faster, less drag. And I imagine more maneuverable on the water. Much more maneuverable. You drive it like a boat. Distinctive to a lake amphibian, of course, is the high-mounted pylon engine. Why do you have an engine way up so high? Well, the, uh, the water aspect would uh, make that the proper place for the propeller to be up high away from the water and away from the spray. That makes sense, but tell me, why do you have throttles? All multi-engine and oh. single-engine flying boats have throttles up on the ceiling. All the flying boats have the throttle overhead, primarily because that's the best place to cable to the engine. A lot of people certainly are going to wonder about an amphibian pilot. You have to land on land with the gear down, you have to land on the water with the gear up, and do you ever make the mistake of maybe starting to make an approach on water with gear down or vice versa? Well, all pilots use checklists, and uh, seaplane pilots uh, have another method. They talk to themselves. <laughs> do the checklist out loud. You do a, a visual and, and talk to yourself out loud. This is a water landing. The wheels are up, and look out the window, and in our airplane you can see the wheels, all three wheels. Coming out of the water, it's just the opposite. Wheels down. Say it out loud. It's a lot better than the sound of the hull scraping concrete. Here's the biggest seaplane that showed up this year, a 700 horsepower turboprop Cessna Caravan on amphibious floats. It operates frequently out of the East River in Manhattan. I talked to Chief Pilot John Kelly about this airplane. John, when we think about single-engine okay. Cessnas, we tend to think about smaller airplanes. But this is a massive machine. Does it pose any kind of a problem when operating it on the water? Well, it's a, it's a big airplane. We have uh, 53 feet of wingspan to deal with, and it uh, weighs 8,000 pounds at its gross weight, so it is uh, a little bit of a problem maneuvering, particularly in tight spots. We normally fly with two crew for exactly that situation so that we can have the, uh, the co-pilot out on the float and handling lines and ready to help us docking or mooring. I don't know. Could you say that this is the largest single on floats? Well, it's certainly the largest uh, uh, single-engine airplane currently on floats. There, whether or not the uh, older single-engine otters were a little bit bigger, or there was an airplane used in the bush quite a bit called the Nordine Norseman, oh, yeah. that might be uh, uh, certainly as larger, if, if not larger. But this is the largest thing in current production, and certainly outperforms either of those two airplanes by a wide margin. 
John, I understand you operate this airplane on salt water. Of course, most seaplane pilots try to avoid salt like the plague. Does it create any problems for you? Well, certainly uh, the biggest problem with salt water is corrosion. Uh, when we've been in salt water, the airplane gets a wash down the minute that it comes in and then it gets thoroughly rinsed and uh, then hand detailed so we make sure there's no salt on there to create corrosion. Now, these floats appear to be, well, they're massive. Do they cost you very much in performance? I would say that we lose about 20 knots to our normal cruise speed. However, we're still able to true out at about uh, 160 plus knots at 10,000 feet. Boy, one impression you get <laughs> sitting here in this cockpit is you're up so doggone high. I, I don't recall ever having been in a small general aviation airplane and being so high off the ground. Uh, pardon me, I guess off the water now. I guess we're up about 10 or 12 feet. The airplane has really good directional control on the water, very good handling. It doesn't feel like a heavy airplane. It uh, controls quite nicely. I am anxious to uh, see what this thing is like in the air, though. It looks like it would be heavy. Lots of power. 700 horsepower does make it want to get up on this step in a great big hurry. There we go on the step. And off the water. Oh, it feels good. Now, surprisingly, it is very heavy on the controls, but as well as it gets off, it doesn't seem to climb all that well. I guess it, it's more for hauling a load than for climbing it at steep angles. Yeah, it is a lot heavier on the controls than I'd imagine. It's uh, fun to fly in a way, but you have to be kind of a masochist. It's, uh, you build arm muscles very quickly. It glides nicely. You can feather the propeller if you need to and make a gliding approach, and it has an awfully good uh, glide ratio. As you come in for the landing, it's really difficult to figure out where the water is because you're so high. Oops, there's a little balloon. I hope you'll forgive that. It's hard to figure out. Just there it is. Okay, power back. And come to a halt. This large airplane is able to handle uh, white caps fairly well. And you can back it up, which is pretty unique for a seaplane. Back into forward pitch, and let's go forward again. I gotta tell you, that's a thrill to fly this machine. It's really a thrill. The International Seaplane Splash In is one of the really fun events in aviation. It's truly unique. More than 300 airplanes were at the Greenville Airport for this festive weekend. With its remote location, only dedicated aviation enthusiasts show up. But with the beautiful scenery and the laid-back atmosphere, this just might be an event to put on your planning calendar for 1989. Seaplane flying is a fun-filled, wonderful, and sometimes wacky slice of general aviation. We hope you've enjoyed this special visit to Moosehead Lake. In this video issue, we've spanned the continental United States with our stories. But in our next quarterly edition, we'll travel to Hawaii. Bill Cox had the really tough assignment to check out flying the islands, and our cameras were there. In addition, Jeff Ethel shows you what it's like to fly a P-51 Mustang. You know, throughout the United States, there are people who make flying more enjoyable for those of us who own or rent planes. Ed and Sue Farnsworth loved to fly, even though they worked in the computer industry in Boston. They spent weekends traveling around the Northeast in their Cessna 182, researching and writing stories for a small magazine that they started themselves called the Northeast Weekend Flyers. For the last three years, many of us followed their suggestions, flying to places that they recommended. Ed quit his job recently to devote all his time to this growing little business. Ed and Sue Farnsworth, along with another couple, were involved in a tragic accident on their way to cover the same seaplane event in Maine that's on this tape. Those of us who fly in the Northeast will remember them each and every time we visit the wonderful places they wrote about.
Hello fellow pilots, I'm Martha King of King Schools. As the saying goes, there are old pilots and bold pilots, but no old bold pilots. One thing that should help you become an old pilot is having an alternate airport in mind even when you're VFR. Then, if you can't land at your destination because of fog, high wind, disabled aircraft on the runway, or whatever reason, you won't have to search frantically through your charts for a suitable airport. Here are some considerations for choosing an alternate airport. First, it should be short of your destination. It makes no sense to overfly your destination into unknown weather and geography. Ideally, it should be forecast to be VFR. It should be downwind. That forecast headwind always seems to increase when you need to go to your alternate. It should be downhill. Having to climb to reach an airport on the other side of a mountain range can really use up fuel reserves. It should have multiple runways. This helps you avoid a crosswind on landing if high winds are a factor. For IFR, it should have multiple approach aids. Navigation equipment failure is always a possibility. And finally, it should be on the same side of a weather front as your destination is. You wouldn't want to fly through that wind, rain, clouds, and turbulence again, would you? Always having an alternate in mind should increase your chances of becoming an old pilot, if not a bold pilot. Here's great news for pilots. How would you like to fly home from Oshkosh next summer in this brand new 1989 Piper Cadet? It's true. You could win this great new Piper airplane, totally IFR equipped by the way, simply by entering King School's all new takeoff sweepstakes. No purchase is required. Any order for King videos automatically enters you to win. This is flying fun in the great Piper tradition. Proven 160 horsepower Lycoming engine. Five hour cruising range with IFR reserve. Four play seating, soundproofing. Air vent system front and back. Control wheel mic button. Full complement of Bendix King avionics. And a true state of the art Darko AR850 altitude encoder. Enter the King takeoff sweepstakes now, simply by ordering any King video. You can select from King's complete new library of single subject action videos designed to take you beyond the written. Communications, how to use your radio for increased safety and utility. Weather wise, everything you need to know about the weather and what to do about it as a pilot. The complete airspace review unscrambles the alphabet soup of airspace requirements and lets you fly anywhere with confidence. Rules to fly by. Learn the hidden secrets of your pilot's operating handbook, how to prevent mechanical problems, avoid optical illusions, and understand the federal aviation regulations. Practical piloting, tricks of the trade, and rules of thumb to get you the most out of your aircraft. VFR with confidence, how to plan a safe trip even in marginal weather conditions. IFR with confidence, advanced navigation and procedures that you need to know to make a safe trip even in a difficult IFR flight. The complete Jefferson chart review. Total understanding of Jefferson approach and in route charts, SIDS, and STARS. Plus, King Takeoff videos now include your private pilot commercial and instrument rating flight test courses. An actual FAA examiner tells you what to expect, and a flight instructor shows you how to demonstrate your knowledge on the ground and in the air. Each flight test course includes two videotapes and the practical test standards booklet. King Takeoff videos, including two tape flight test courses, are sold singly for $39 each. Or you can order any five for only $79. Or get all 11 takeoff videos for only $139. Every King written exam course contains at least five two-hour videotapes. King course book with detailed notes. Every FAA question and correct answer. Practice exams with answers and explanations a sign-off form to take your FAA exam, and a beautiful personalized graduation certificate suitable for framing. King written exam courses include private pilot, commercial pilot, instructor FOI, instrument, instrument instructor, ATB 121 dispatcher, and flight engineer exam courses. 
And each course is now only $149. That's right, $149, the complete total price, which includes the exam course of your choice, plus your flight test course, plus your choice of any four of the new King Takeoff videos. And your order automatically enters you in the takeoff sweepstakes. Your chance to win a brand new Piper Cadet. Call 1-800-854-1001 right now. Your order will be processed immediately and shipped the same day it's received. Plus, you have a 20-day free trial. And if you fail your test, you can actually keep the course and get your money back. King Schools. Four takeoff videos and your flight test course free with your exam course order. Everything only $149. An unbelievable price. Plus, your order automatically enters you in the takeoff sweepstakes to win the Piper Cadet. King's the one. Ask anyone who flies. Use the enclosed sweepstakes entry form or call King Schools now. We're here 24 hours a day to take your order at 1-800-854-1001. That's 1-800-854-1001. Call now. Rouen, you don't have the stress of a constantly very fine thing because it's right there on your machine and it's so easy to use it's just a couple of knobs and, and it took me uh, one trip to learn about 95 percent of, of the machine and i'm not a button person I, I don't like to use vo i don't like to use adf i don't like to use instruments and it was really easy now with the with the m1 you know we always worry about when we look on the window and we see a hazy day and not very good visibility we, we always ask us how we're going to make that hair show and that's one of the questions now we we not well we don't talk about we don't we don't even say that question anymore the, the features that i really like it's all the information about the airport and it's nice to know the length of the runway and the orientation because we know what the winds are we go click 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 and we have the length of the runway right away one thing is pretty good too when you you plug your, your route to go from here to, uh, to Chicago, for example, they're going to tell you right away, on your route, you're going to cross such and such a TCA. And, oh, uh, when and you ARSA. And ARSA. So when you're getting close to the ARSA, they even give you the time you're going to go in and which frequency you have to contact. One of the features we really like uh, on the M1 too, is in case of you have to land immediately at the, the emergency uh, landing. You know, you just have to plug uh, two switches and they give you right away the closest airport when you, uh, you, have, you, can, you can land. Yeah. And if you don't with don't, the longest runway, with the directly, longest runway, you don't have to look if you for don't, it. If you don't like it, the runway is too short, or grass runway, you go to the next one and you, you choose the airport, the best airport you, you want to go. Yeah. A nice feature that they have also, um, it's sometimes when it's very, very bumpy, we found that it's hard to pick up a book and find the ident of the airport you want to go to. And you can find the airport either by the town or the name, the full name of the airport. And it's, it's very, the, the way to enter the letter, you don't even have to look at, at the machine. You can still look and clear all the traffic outside and, and you turn those little knob and it goes very quick and it's very easy. Uh, first of all, I'd like to uh, welcome you all again to Sussex uh, 88. This is the schedule for today, and there'll probably be some changes for tomorrow. Right. Just put Acme Duck Part 4 in there. Right. Right. Before, just before the French Connection and after Jim Roberts with a long easy. Well, we, we've been together for over 15 years now, and like you say, we, we have a lot of common points. We both love flying. Yeah. Yeah. We both like uh, to perfect things. And um, we also complement each other. 
I'm more down to earth. He's more artistic. Um, I'm closer to the money. But yeah, I but spend but it. But yeah, he spends <laughs> it. Um, maybe I'm turn to the left, maybe. Yeah, I don't see anything coming back. Whoop, I'm going to crash. I've known the French Connection airshow team since about late 1973 or early 1974. I think that I have learned something about uh, North Star avionics. Uh, it tells me something when I see a company or the management of a company make a decision to go with a first class airshow act like the French Connection and support them in a uh, North American tour. That says that they have imagination and they have some progressive thinking. And I'm certain that that reflects through to their line of products. Well, we almost, always make sure, you know, some people say, oh, uh, you know, they see the sign and they say, oh, no wonder, you know, you, uh, you have a North Star in, in the aircraft because you're sponsored by them. And every time I say, well, we bought one first and then we got involved with them. We both together really make one, one, uh, how we say, one team. Uh, one one team. team. Exclusively from Pilot's Video Source, The Secret War. This amazing series of six programs available for the first time in the United States reveals the top secret aviation technology of World War II. Shot on location, this is the true inside story. The existence of these secret weapons was unknown to all but a few. At the end of the airfield, of the airfield boundary, you already reached about 500 miles per hour. And with constant speed, you were climbing up in one and a half till two minutes into a height of 30,000 feet. And I can only tell you, it was fascinating. It was like thundering through the skies, sitting on a cannon ball. From rocket-powered fighters to electronic guidance systems, this is the fascinating story of the secret weapons that influenced the course of history. Never shown on television in the U.S., The Secret War is available for just $99 for all six one-hour programs. For your aviation video library, here are some classic full-length motion pictures packed with flying action and featuring your favorite stars like Jimmy Stewart. If I strip it of everything, add extra tanks, I figure to fly three times that far. One, two, three, all the way to that knot hole. What's the knot hole? Paris. Well, I guess I might as well go. This is the true and exciting story of Charles Lindbergh's Atlantic Crossing. Cut it, Slim! See real-life pilot Jimmy Stewart give the finest performance of his career. Take off with Lindbergh and share the adventure. Put me down another step. Make me a captain, sir, but let me stay in the air with my boys. This is the true story of the early life of Billy Mitchell, who fought to expand the role of aviation in the U.S. Armed Forces. But the airplane is an unproved weapon. I'll prove it to you if you let me. I haven't won. Not till we get an Air Force. For his vision, for his courage, Billy Mitchell was tried by his country. This is where we separate the men from the boys. Look out, the Duke's on the stick. You can't fly much lower than that, can you? Only if you're a bachelor. With a squadron of rookies. I know you fellas haven't been trained for close support. So observe my first run. I'm coming in at treetop level, and I don't want to see anybody above me. Corny, but collectible. It's a fine action movie. Now push. 
Cloud Dancer celebrates aerobatic flying with some of the most magnificent aerial photography ever brought to the screen. A terror to the earthbound, but a joy to the pilot. This motion picture puts you in the cockpit of a pits and takes you inside the world of international aerobatic competition. Very limited distribution accounts for the higher price of this unique specialized film. 18 minutes the attack bombers, three points to your right, altitude about 15,000. Well, what do you know? Only three to one. Another great action adventure starring John Wayne. Look it, when, when? Termites. Out to win the war and the woman he loves. I'm not going to ask you what to do if that chute doesn't open, because you'll say, take it back to the factory. This print was lovingly restored by the UCLA Archive Project and is a wonderful tribute to the P-40 and the men who flew them in the war in China. Flat Top brings you some of the best Corsair action ever filmed. Shot in Technicolor, it is the story of a hotshot pilot grounded during the peak of action in the Pacific War. The storyline is, however, secondary to the magnificent footage. The action is first rate, and for any Warbird enthusiast, this is an interesting and rare videotape for your collection. You're just gonna unzip that starboard wing and lift it up all the way over from the other side and tag it onto this port boom, is that correct? We do need a pilot on this project, Mr. Towns, and frankly, I considered your chances of survival quite remote. That great engine didn't make it, the other probably won't either. Don't miss Jimmy Stewart in this great survival adventure. Also available from Pilot's Video Source is this unique documentary film, The Story of the Flying Wing. Produced by Northrop Corporation, its purpose was to demonstrate the advantages of the YB-49A flying wing over a more conventional design, undoubtedly to influence the funding of further development and production. In this film, you'll see how the airplane is flown with elevons for roll and pitch control and unique split rudders which provide yaw control and speed brakes. The film includes interesting cockpit details, such as this massive throttle quadrant for eight turbojet engines, and it shows in simplified terms some of the engineering principles of the flying wing. The film is especially relevant in view of the fact that this airplane is closely related to the most secret and advanced stealth technology today. Want to learn more about the flying wing? This very rare 23-minute film is a unique addition to your video library. The story of the flying wing is available for $24.95 plus $3 shipping and handling from Pilot's Video Source. But as a special offer to subscribers of ABC's Wide World of Flying, it is available free with any purchase of $99 or more. You may order several single titles or The Secret War to total this amount. To order by credit card, call toll-free 1-800-223-3556. In California, call 1-800-445-4944. Please place your order between 9 and 5 Pacific Time, Monday through Friday. If necessary, use the pause button on your VCR to copy down these phone numbers. You may also return the enclosed order form to send us a personal check at the address shown. Defective tapes may be returned for replacement. Don't miss this limited free tape offer. Order now. The Aircraft Owners and Pilots Association was founded in 1939 to lobby for general aviation and to promote the safety and interests of pilots. The organization has grown to over 260,000 active members with its headquarters in Frederick, Maryland, just outside Washington, D.C. We thought you would enjoy an inside look at the AOPA headquarters to get a better idea of how the AOPA serves general aviation today. Through the years, one of the most important uh, services your association performs is representing the interests of general aviation pilot before the Congress, the government agencies, and the state legislatures. Uh, it's an area we spend a tremendous amount of time on, uh, an area where we have problems with, with regularity. Some of the pressing problems currently have to do with the access to airspace, proper utilization of our tax money at the federal level, uh, an ominous attempt at the federal level now to regulate through legislation. We at AOPA spend a tremendous amount of time on these issues. In addition to working with lawmakers, AOPA often takes its messages right to the public. Another important facet of the AOPA is the services it provides to members, some of the more popular services which are just a phone call away. I understand you're purchasing your first aircraft. 
Buying an airplane? AOPA can help with technical advice and low-cost financing. Halifax is an airport of entry, and let me give you the number for customs. Planning an international flight? AOPA can help you with the paperwork and planning. That report is available from the National Technical Information Service. Got an aviation-related question? AOPA's research department can help find an answer. There's some insight as to why the FAA is requesting a thallium fuel. Got a medical problem? AOPA's experts can help you understand how to deal with the situation. One of the most popular benefits of AOPA membership is Pilot Magazine. It's aimed exclusively at the information needs of active pilots to keep them abreast of the world of general aviation. In addition to its lobbying efforts and services to members, the AOPA is vitally involved in training and communications to improve the safety and enjoyment of flying. And through the Air Safety Foundation, AOPA reaches tens of thousands of pilots every year with its critical message of pilot proficiency and knowledge. A lot of us remember when flying was just that, simply flying. Unfortunately, it's become far more complex. We're all concerned about liability, about taxes, about costs, uh, and we're obviously all concerned about safety. We want to reassure you that AOPA is here day in, day out, fighting the battles to ensure that you and I can still do what we love most, simply fly. And if you happen to get in the Frederick area, please come by the airport and see us, uh, those of us at the association representing your interests. To join the Aircraft Owners and Pilots Association and receive all the benefits of being a member, plus Pilot Magazine every month, simply call their toll-free number, 1-800-USA-AOPA. They will be pleased to answer any questions you may have and will take membership information right over the phone. If you are viewing a borrowed copy of Wide World of Flying and would enjoy having your own subscription, or if you'd like to order a subscription as a very special gift for a pilot or aviation enthusiast, credit card holders may call us toll-free at 1-800-999-8783. Or you may send a personal check to our subscription center in Riverton, New Jersey. The price is just $99.95 for one full year.